there's a few reasons of why. Why would you want to actually look at this data? I'm going to load the data in this region, but I'm also going to load the sequence in this region. A lot of times, if you're looking at a region that has a huge memory load of your data, you might not want to load the sequence. So here we are. I've got several genes, and I've loaded several pieces of data. And I'm going to show you some of the analytic methods you can use on your data to get an idea of what's going on. So I'm going to select my two data tracks. Again, I'm going to click the first one, and I'm going to hold down the Shift button and click the second to select them both. And I'm going to come over here to this area called Operations. Operations are functions that can be applied to these tracks. The single track functions are things like copy this track, show me only the mismatches, but I'd like to see them in a graphical format. There's um, show me all the region that does not have annotated material, etc. The ones we're going to focus on now are fine junction and depth. And I'll explain them as we begin to look at them. But first, I'll choose fine junction and apply. And what that will do is it will apply to each of these individual tracks. While we still have these two tracks selected, I'm also going to choose depth. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to create a graph, not an annotation, which again is a model representing your data. It's going to create an actual mathematical graph. And what a depth graph is, is a numerical summary of every read that's stacked on a nucleotide across this region. So it will take all of those reads, those very tall stacks of reads, and render, to, render them down into a mathematical output. What the fine junction track will tell you is it will look at all of the reads that actually had to have a gap introduced before it would successfully align to the genome. Those are pretty often indicative of introns, but we call them gapped reads. We've derived from our data two very helpful pieces of information. But as you notice, these tracks take up a lot of room. So I'm going to come back here to the Data Access tab, and what I'm going to do, you can see that each track is named both by the original name and the function you apply to it. I'm going to hide these tracks. What that means is they're not taking up room on my screen, but I can very readily get them back to be able to look at them. Now that they're out of the way, you can see these, both, all of these derived tracks much easier. Coming back to the annotation tab, there's a few keys to IGBY created tracks. First of all, they're marked with a yellow bar to show you that they were created in IGBY and to remind you that if you want to save this information, you really need to save track. Save track will allow you to save the graphs out as .wig, that is the wiggle format, or it's also called a bed graph. And these are graphs with just a little extra information, but they should be visible in any program that can use a bed graph. And these junction tracks are saved out as bed, or bed detail tracks. Again, they can be visualized in any program that will look at those. If you need to take a picture and you want to show off this picture for a journal, as you notice, there's a variety of little helpful tools in IGBY, the zoom bar and the zoom label telling you your exact genomic position. These particular marks are called collapse and expand. When you collapse your data, you generate an overlaid summary of all of the data in there. And that can be helpful, again, when you have large tracks filling space. Obviously, the lock mark and the IGBY mark. These can be hidden. We have a, a tool called Hide Visual Tools that will make all of that disappear so that you can make good, clean pictures. And it's very simple to get it back with Show All Visible Tools and it will show you all of the tools that are currently marked 
in case you want to turn off any one of them individually. So the first thing you'll notice in these depth graphs, if we look, these look approximately the same. This looks like there's a lot more cold than there is control, and certainly the same here. And yet I point out to you, they're actually on different scales from each other. We're going to go to the graph tab now. And when we look at these in the graph, we notice these are set to 100%. That is 100% of the information is showing. But that doesn't mean they have the same amount of information. So what I'm going to choose to do is I'm going to select by value. And I'm actually going to change the scale that this information is drawn on. I'm going to go to 1500. And what you can see is both graphs have been adjusted. And suddenly we see there is more here than there is here, but there's definitely less of this gene than this now that we've rendered them to the same scale. In fact, I may even choose a thousand. And there's a, there is a good way to be able to look at the data. I did a webinar last month called Focus on a Feature, where I went through all of the wonderful things you can do with graphs. Um, and that can be seen on our Igby channel on YouTube. The semantic zoom means that we see more information as we zoom in. One of the great things about Igby again, it's an annotation track, we're going to the annotation tab, is you can set a label. You can show information or not that's in this track. I'm going to set it to show score. What score is, is going to actually give me the exact numeric value. How many times within my control alignment data was this exact gap seen? And the answer is 76. So we can take this junction track and ask how many times was each junction represented? And by looking at numbers, we can sometimes see interesting things. For instance, in the cold, all of these junctions show up quite a number of times, but there seems to be a low number of gapped reads on this end. And if we look at the graph, we can see that there's low representation of that. Now, that may be totally artifact from the new alumina, or it could indicate that something is happening biologically. It's worth noting or following up later. Now, that's all well and good for a gene that has one model. But what happens when we look in this sort of area? Here, we have a gene that says there's only one possible model here, and yet we have two junctions. All right, well, this is worth investigating. We can look at it a little closer. There's a, another feature in IBB that is very helpful when you're doing this sort of comparison called edge matching, and that's automatically active. What that means is if you select a feature, in one row, then every other feature that shares a start or a stop position will also become highlighted. I hope you can see that I selected the six junction for controls, and yet all of these bars and this end right here in the model are all highlighted to show me that they all share this end. Now, what's very interesting is that the 32 junction and the 6 junction also are exactly the same on this end, but that's not shared with the annotated model. When you see something like that, I put the zoom stripe on it so that I can zoom in. What this is telling us is that our data does not support that junction. It supports a junction over here. I'm going to momentarily hide the zoom stripe label so that you can see the sequence. And what you can see is that these junctions start and stop using this nucleotide, not this one. 
So this model might be wrong. Now, the model might be right in other samples or other tissue, but clearly there's a gene model that is not present that represents the information in our sample. Now, what you can also see is when I select the one, this doesn't share an end with anything else. When you see something like that, sometimes it's an artifact of biology, sometimes it's an artifact of sequencing, and sometimes it's just a cryptic that is a very underused splice site. And as we move around and explore our data, we're able to see a lot of these different elements, such as models that aren't necessarily correct. And that's not something that you would see if you only did the computational analysis. Here's another time where it's good to be able to look at the information. Here, you can see there's two gene models. And what IGBI allows us to do, again using the edge match, we can select this model. And you can see the junction in question is here to here. And again, the models we see up here don't exactly match. Whereas if we select the upper gene model, we can see that the 16 in the cold and the 7 in the control do exactly align to model number, I believe that's 2. One, two. There we go. So model 2 for this gene, we have agreement. We used that junction exactly as it was annotated. But here you can see that the 3 and the 7 are the same junction, but once again, we don't match what the model is reported to say. And this allows you to explore inconsistencies where you have to trust your data, since this is biology, your data defines what occurs. And here, the data is saying that this model is wrong, or at least the data is saying there's a model that's missing. And the one other reason that I love being able to visualize data is right here. If you notice, our junction tracks are showing junctions in this area, but they're sort of floating in space. So I'm going to go look at the graph track, and I'm going to change the scale down, let's say, to 100, and ask it, well, do I have reads in the region? And and clearly there are some, so I'm going to make it a little shorter so that I can see them better. And there's definitely reads in the region. And between the coverage and the gaps, it really implies that there's a gene here. And yet you can see in my annotation track, there is no gene. So this is one of those moments where we want to actually see alignment tracks. I'm going to optimize. You can see that absolutely in both the cold and the control, there's unquestionably reads that aligned into this region. There definitely seems to be intron structure, and yet there is no annotation, and we have essentially discovered a new gene. I did further research on this, and it looks more like this is a pseudogene, a duplication that's no longer utilized, but clearly RNA is still made from it, since that's what RNA-seq is, and it still has the layout of the original parent gene. Another way, and again, I can use the collapse to get the reference to, to get our data tracks out of the way, or I can just hide them and bring them back later. There's a lot of reason that you want to look at your data and explore your data in a visual browser. And obviously, we've designed IGBI to really be able to address almost all of your needs. And we are constantly updating. At the moment, we are in the process of getting the next version ready to go. We're constantly developing new features. So if you have any requests, for a feature that would help you 
in exploring your data and in starting your analysis, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you.